Blee's Farming Past and Present video lecture. Today I'm going to share with you some of the results of my ethnographic research that I conducted with my husband on an organic farm in Belize, Central America. The name of the project was Belize Farming Past and Present. First, let's turn to understand who the ancient Maya were and where they lived. In its heyday from about A.D. 250 to 900, the Maya civilization boasted hundreds of cities across a vast swath of Central America. Now, archaeological sites these once flourishing cities extended from Chichen Itza in the northern Yucatan to Copan, about 400 miles to the south, in modern-day Honduras. Each bore ceremonial centers where theocratic rulers practiced a complex religion based on a host of gods, a unique calendar, and ceremonies that featured a ball game and human sacrifice. The ancient Maya also mastered astronomy, mathematics, art, and architecture and a glyph system of writing on stone, ceramics, and paper. Here's a picture of El Castillo, a building located on an archaeological site called Shunantanich in uh, East Central Belize. This is where I originally worked as an archaeologist about 15 years ago. Off in the upper left-hand corner of this image, you can see from the top of, ca of the Castillo where the organic farm is located. In the earlier part of the 20th century, anthropologists thought that the ancient Maya were slash and burn agriculturalists, like they were early in this century. Some Maya still practice slash and burn agriculture in Mesoamerica. Slash and burn agriculture is considered an extensive form of agriculture that usually can sustain lower population levels because it requires a great deal of land to fully utilize the resources. The farmers would burn the fields during the dry season and plant their seeds right before the rainy season. After they, that, they would harvest their crops, and then they'd grow another crop where they might decide to abandon their fields and leave them empty or fallow for up to 18 or 19 years. In doing so, they reduce the likelihood of weeds and soil depletion. The farmers extend where they farm to a much larger area. This is in comparison to intensive agriculture. Results from the Shunantanich Settlement Survey showed that the ancient Maya were practicing terrace agriculture, which is a form of intensive agriculture. This slide shows you what a set of terraced fields might have looked like in the past. Here is another picture of a terraced landscape. We also have evidence of different agricultural tools that were probably used during the ancient Maya times, from old books dating back to the latter part of the Maya civilization. I conducted an ethnological study of agricultural practices throughout Mesoamerica to find out what kinds of tools the Maya might have used to farm intensively in the past. This slide shows you some of the archaeological agricultural tools we found when excavating the terraces. On the left, we have smaller, sharp tools, a polishing stone for making pottery, and a small, hoe-like tool. In the center, we have sharp, flake tools and a small, hoe-like tool. And on the right, we have large, digging and hoe-like tools, and what we call a general utility pie face, which was probably used for many different kinds of activities, much like today's machete. The ethnographic literature revealed that they used a machete, pickaxe, and hoe to weed, cleared the tropical forests, and to prepare the fields. They used a digging stick to plant the seeds, and they used any sharp tool to harvest or cut the crops from the plants. I also examined all the literature to determine who was doing the work. I wanted to know if the men, women, and children all participated in field work. It turned out that they did, yet most lactating women, or women with babies, helped farm or garden closer to the home. So now that you have a little background on the ancient Maya, let's take a look at the present day Maya. For the past two years, I have been working on the Foothill Belize program, running one of the cultural components of the project. The Foothill Belize program, sponsored by Foothill College in Los Altos, California, and the Belize Institute of Archaeology, is an undergraduate program that balances community development and ethnographic experiences with archaeology. 
For four weeks, students learn about the modern and past cultures of Belize through a variety of experiential learning activities. Ted, my husband, and I co-directed one of these programs called the Belize Farming Past and Present Project. Our previous research in this geographic area focused on agricultural intensification through a study of agricultural terracing during the Classic period, which dates to about A.D. 300 to 890, near the ancient Maya center, Shunantanich, which is located in west-central Belize. Ted, my husband, described terracing spatial extent, so where they're located, physical form, and soils, how they were built, and what the soils were like. He also reconstructed the population densities. To meet the rising food demand, farmers intensified their farming practices by moving into areas where the land was less productive, and they constructed terraces to farm on marginal land. One of the primary goals of our project was to de describe the present-day intensive agricultural practices used on an organic farm very close to Shunantanich. That was, we did this so we could better inform our archaeological interpretations of how the farmers who lived in the Shunantanich area made decisions during a period of high food production and agricultural intensification. When we ca compare agricultural intensification on the, on the organic farm to the ancient Maya agricultural terrace farming, we need to recognize some of the differences such as tool material types, water sources, pests, field form, and plant species. Yet we must also realize that they share many common characteristics such as soils, microclimates, growing season, land use patterns, intensive farming practices, and similar intensive farming tasks. With this recognition, the farm is an ideal laboratory to study agricultural intensification because the resort owners, the farm is actually located on a resort called Chow Creek, they have increased energy inputs on a small part of their property, simulating a land shortage. Some of the land on the farm is marginal in terms of agricultural suitability when compared to the surrounding area. The resort restaurant creates a demand for organically grown produce, and the farmers are making an effort to farm traditionally, sustainably, organically, and organically, which is what the ancient Maya were actually doing. Moreover, we assume the farm as an ecosystem is similar to ancient Maya farms. Consequently, we thought it was an appropriate laboratory for studying agricultural t intensification in this region. Located just 3.82 miles northeast of Shunantanich, the 33-acre organic farm was conceived of by Mick and Lucy Fleming, who owned the lodge at Chaw Creek. Chaw Creek is an eco resort that consists of a 365 acre nature reserve that sits along the banks of the McCall River in the foothills of the Maya Mountains and is home to a number of exotic jungle dwellers, including peccaries, jaguar, monkeys, and many others, as well as over 300 species of t tropical migratory birds. The organic farm provides pr fresh food for the resort. Seven farmers combine traditional Maya hoe farming methods with more advanced raised bed systems to produce native and non-native fruit trees and vegetables, which form a dynamic mosaic similar to the ancient Maya landscape of the past. The farm is located in a tropical rainforest environment with an average yearly temperature of 84 degrees Fahrenheit, with a consistent humidity of 85%. In the winter, the temperature seldom falls below 60 degrees, with summer temperatures averaging around 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Along with these tropical temperatures, West Central Belize has a wet and dry season. The dry season occurs roughly between February and May. During the period we were working, from the last week of June to the third week of July, we flew in with the first hurricane of the season, Hurricane Alex, and then it was relatively dry with very few afternoon rainstorms. With this type of tropical environment, the growing season is year-round. We used archaeological survey and mapping techniques, soil test pits, time allocation data, and personal interviews to describe how the farmers intensified production on the farm. 
During our first field season, we mapped the farm and described the soils, intensive agricultural tasks and farming strategies, and started a plant inventory. During our second season, we completed the map, continued to describe the, the fields and the plants, and completed our plant inventory. We recorded 22 agricultural features including multi-use plots, shade structures, a barn area, compost bins, seedling shade houses, a trellis, and a guada. The farm also had several archaeological features including three small mounds, a chaltoon, which is a storage area, and possibly agricultural terrace features. Understanding the soils on the farm was essential to understanding and identifying the impact that the microclimates have on productivity and on farmers' decision-making regarding the placement of fields. Due to a large hill located in the west central area, the farm had several microclimates defined by slope, soil drainage properties, and sun intensity. The average elevation on the farm was approximately 390 feet above sea level, and the soils in the area were dark, organic-rich mollusols that overlay a limestone rock strata. Four soil test pits were excavated in areas adjacent to the fields. In soil test pit 1, 2, and 4, the soil ranged from a light to dark brown silty clay with a sparse amount of small, less than 2 centimeters, irregularly shaped limestone inclusions. Soil pH ranged from 6 to 6.2, and the soil depth in these three soil test pits extended below 65 centimeters from the surface. The farmers informed us that when it rains, these three test pits are typically underwater. Consequently, no crops were grown in this area due to poor drainage and the sticky nature of the soil. The farmers called the soil black cotton. Soil test pit number three, which was located along the eastern base of a limestone hill. The farmers told us that this was very good soft soil for planting. All of the most productive plots were located along the east side of the limestone hill and contained the same soil as that found in soil test pit number three. Stratum A was a sandy claim loam with few inclusions. With a depth below surface of 27 to 37 centimeters, the soil pH was 7.1, ideal for agricultural productivity. Stratum B had a sandy texture with frequent small 2 to 10 centimeter irregular limestone inclusions. Stratum B sat right on top of the limestone bedrock at approximately 50 centimeters below the surface. Based on the result of the to soil test pits and informal interviews with the farmers, we found out that all the soils were very productive when augmented with additives such as compost and chicken manure. The additives also created a neutral pH equals 7, well-drained, productive soil. The major limiting factor to plant growth was that the combination of an organically rich clay in low-lying areas resulted in poorly drained soils, which completely impeded plant growth. Along with describing the physical and natural characteristics of the farm, we also needed to describe what the farmers do and how often they do it. One of the premises of agricultural intensification is that as farmers intensify their farming practices, they also spend more time maintaining their crops. Consequently, we described all the intensive agricultural tasks and recorded how much time was spent doing these tasks by conducting a time allocation study. Students worked with the farmers as they recorded their tasks and the tools they were using every five minutes four weeks. The five minute interval allowed us to capture a great deal of variability in the activities associated with intensive agriculture. A summary of the time allocation study showed that a majority of time was spent preparing the soil and maintaining the crops. In addition, farmers spent quite a bit of time doing various composting activities. Soil preparation secondary activities included adding and transporting soil additives, aerating the soil, clearing vegetation, mulching, removing rocks, tilling the beds with a rototiller, and turning the soil with a hoe. Crop maintenance secondary activities included clearing mulch, dead leaf removal, dead plant removal, monitoring crops, mulching, 
setting up vine poles, transporting additives, watering, and weeding. Intensive agriculture in both the past and present require these ongoing energy inputs. Organic farmers, like the ancient Maya farmers, spend little if any fossil fuel energy and tend to do all the work by hand. Their principal investment is what their labor produces through a harvest. Consequently, we can ultimately calculate the rate of return on invested labor. We started the first step in this process, which was to determine the tasks and tools associated with intensive agriculture, and then to document, through an ethnography, the amount of time doing these tasks using time allocation study, which can then be converted to human energy expenditures. We worked with the farmers to complete formal questionnaires and to conduct informal interviews to understand farmers' decision-making regarding plot location and the different types of intensive farming methods. The farmers decided to locate most of their fields on moderate, gentle, east-facing slopes and areas full of sun where the soil was primarily 6 to 12 inches deep. In addition, the farmers decided to position, position the planting beds so they were parallel to the slope. Almost 60% were located on a flat or sloping field while most of the lettuce was grown in shaded raised beds. The farmers grew their seedlings under a shade structure in boxed shelves. Interplanting is one intensive farming strategy where two or more crops are grown together in an alternating rows to be more efficient with the land, reduce pests, and protect the soil. Sometimes, fields have slower growing, longer season crops with slower growing, fast mature crops. Several varieties of lettuce were planted together with some vertical climbers, like cucumbers. Seven species of banana trees were interspersed throughout the banana field. Succession planting is also another intensive farming strategy, where the farmers increase crop availability by timing when to plant particular crops, so they have a continuous harvest during the year-long growing season. Farmers took advantage of succession planting by more than 70% of the fields. The few fields that did not have succession planting contained larger trees like cahoon palms and banana trees. Mulching is another intensive farming strategy where farmers use organic materials or cardboard to protect the soil and modify the effects of the climate. Mulching helps to protect exposed soil to reduce erosion, evaporation, and weeds, and to retain mulch moisture. Farmers mulch 50% of their beds. The only fields that did not have any mulch were the lettuce raised beds. Like mulching, shading is an intensive farming strategy that modifies the effects of the environment by reducing sunlight intensity. The only fields that were not shaded were the larger vegetable fields that contained tomatoes, peppers, okra, ginger flower, peas, and cabbage. During our first year, we started a plant inventory of common names by field plot. We finished up this inventory in 2011. Numerous herbs, including parsley, mint, cilantro, and several varieties of basil were growing on the farm. Twelve kinds of lettuce were grown on the shaded raised beds. Native fruits and vegetables were interspersed with a variety of trees, ornamental flowers, and other medicinal plants throughout all the fields. The students conducted research to complete the plant inventory, which included the plant genus and species names, varieties, geographic origin, and cultural uses. Our two-year project set out to conduct an ethnography of the farm and farm work associated with agricultural intensification on the Chaw Creek Organic Farm. We discovered a variety of microclimates that affect food production. We also documented the amount of work that went into that production. The most important lesson that we learned had to do with the dynamism of the farm landscape. At the end of our first field season, the farmers decided to construct raised fields in the low-lying area with marginal land with the sticky black cotton. We documented their progress in the following season. Other data that we collected and still need to analyze is a daily weight of all the different types of food that came out from the farm and da daily weather data for the last seven years. 
This can contribute to our understanding of how much energy it takes to produce a certain amount of food in the tropical jungle environment. By looking at farming through the eyes of farmers who work the land in similar ecosystems, we hope it will promise to shed light on agricultural intensification practices in the region as well as in the tropics in general. Thank you.